professor in the Earth and Biological Sciences Department at Loma Linda University. He's got a few degrees and I won't go into that. We want to give him as much time. So looking at the clock, he'll go on for about an hour. And please don't forget, this afternoon we will have afternoon programs. So stick around for potluck and continue to stay with us. Dr. Brand, I'll give it to you. Thank you. Morning. Well, we're enjoying the fossil show, and it's good to be here with you folks and uh, talk about things that we value. <clears throat> Talking about Genesis and um, science, how, what's the relationship between those? First of all, uh, what's kind of, why do we care about this? <clears throat> You're going to hear more about this at, at, at later, but anyway, just we all have choices to make. Uh, many important choices, some that uh, may not seem at first so important. Choose for yourselves this day who you will serve. A famous uh, expression by, by Joshua, <clears throat> as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Okay, so that's our choice. And so what does this choice involve? Well, there's a choice between divine wisdom and human wisdom. Um, we think we know quite a bit, and we've learned an awful lot, uh, you know, in the last couple of centuries. But I suppose <clears throat> if the total of human knowledge, of, of not human, but the total of, of knowledge about the universe was, was like this much. Okay, we started out with the time of Galileo, we knew this much. We've moved a lot. We've moved way over here. <laughs> uh, but we think we know a lot. <clears throat> and, you know, we know something. But the choice between divine wisdom and human wisdom is a very significant choice. Just give an example here. <clears throat> Jesus said, put that out into deep water and let down your nets. And uh, Peter, I think it was, said, well, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. So. You know, they know how to fish. They've fished here for all their lives. They know you don't catch fish in the daytime. Uh, but Jesus said, put your boat out in deep water and let down your nets. So divine wisdom compared with human wisdom. And the, their thinking was, let's see what happened. Uh, their thinking was based on a lot of information. I don't know where that came from. Maybe somebody can help me with that. And uh, so they, they knew how to fish, but, uh, but, but God knows some things that, that we don't know anything about. And uh, <clears throat> there's, a lot, there's a lot of that. And so uh, those of us who deal with science and care about the Bible, we have to think about this um, all the time. <clears throat> and there are many choices to make. And I'm going to talk about the, the, the effect of some of these choices. And we won't talk about saguaro cactuses, but we'll get back here in a minute. And the, um, okay, thank you. So, uh, we're, uh, it's amazing we have a, a God who, who cares about it. He's, he directs the universe every day guides things and going, and yet he cares about communicating with us. And he, uh, like I say, he knows some things that we don't know. And <clears throat> there are choices. There's someone who has another choice for us, and he thinks he knows better, or tries to pretend he knows better. And that can affect how we think. So we're looking at science here. The goal of science is to discover facts about our world. And, you know, there are untold number of scientists doing this every day. The goal of the book of Genesis tell, is to God tells us the facts about origins. So that, that's a different source of information. Human wisdom and divine wisdom. And so... Um, you know, my scientist friends, they, they think this doesn't work. You can't put these two together. 
because we know, uh, we've, we've discovered a lot of things. And so there's conflict here between these two in the minds of most people, most scientists at least. But is it, is it possible we could turn this around and make these be mutually supportive? For they each help, it, they help each other. Well, I think so. So why is this seen by many people as a conflict? This conflict between human wisdom and divine wisdom. Uh, I think it starts, I'm, I, I know it starts here. I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I will make myself like the most high. There's this, you know, it, it, it's flattering to think that we can find better answers. And Satan decided, he, Lucifer decided he wanted to have a, have a better answer. And that, of, uh, that thinking is uh, still with us very much so. Let's talk about foundations. <clears throat> If you're going to build a house, you better think about the foundation first. And so every project has a foundation. If we're building a house or building a church, you just start with concrete, something pretty solid. Uh, when we're doing science, the foundation is a little different. It's, um, it's a bit more flexible. We're talking about ideas, assumptions, worldviews. These are the foundation from on which science starts. And of course, there are different foundations that different people use. <clears throat> so what are the foundations for the study of the history of life? Well, here are two foundations, human wisdom alone, naturalism. Um, over the last couple of centuries or so, this, a concept has developed we refer to as methodological naturalism. Naturalism is a philosophy that says that you Science must never give any supernatural explanations for anything. The laws of nature alone, <clears throat> the laws of chemistry, the laws of physics, that's where we start. There can be nothing above that. <clears throat> that is naturalism. There's no creator. Um, even if I think there's a creator, if I'm going to do science, I must leave him out of the picture. That's naturalism. <clears throat> Human wisdom alone. Divine wisdom starts with creation, the fall, and the global flood. These things that sound pretty, pretty strange to a person who follows naturalism. So we have two very different foundations. And so what difference does the foundation make for science? Um, it depends somewhat on, on what we're doing. Um, and I will divide science here into two categories. And there's not a sharp line between these, but they're, they're, they are different. The one category here uh, represented at the top is doing things that we can do in the laboratory or, or uh, in nature, but we're observing things that are happening right now. If I'm a physiologist, I got white rats, I can study what's happening in their bodies, I can do my studies over and over and over again. And it's still tough, life is pretty complex, but we can, we can make progress in understanding because we're observing something happening right in front of us. So <clears throat> uh, even if, I, if I'm doing something like that, I, I tend to pray for success and understanding, but a person who uh, is, doesn't do that, they're following naturalism, their philosophy may not really um, make it hard for them to find what they want to find because it doesn't matter so much. They are studying the laws of chemistry and the laws of physics. And we've learned over a couple centuries that God doesn't tinker with the laws of nature on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, he, he made the laws to govern the universe and make it work. He made the laws that will decide what's going to happen in your test tube. And so he doesn't mess with those. The other category of science is ta talking about the past. What happened? Uh, it, in history. We're talking here now about events um, and processes from the ancient past that we cannot observe. Um, I don't have a time machine and I don't think any of you do, so I can't go back. We look at these rocks and we try to understand them and it's very fascinating, but there are limits in what we can do when we're studying origins, when we're studying the past. And so that's what we're going to be talking about here. 
The question of conflict or mutual support is most pertinent when we're studying ancient history, studying origins. That's where the, the conflict uh, comes. <coughs> So, um, let's look at this a little more then. Conventional science, that's a term, a, a convenient term to refer to the prevailing th thought in science about the naturalistic view of the universe. Uh, conventional science. Um, it has a handicap. It, it's based on an uncertain foundation, a, a false worldview, uh, and the worldview that depends on, on naturalism. So that's a handicap. Um, I've had people ask me, are other, found, other scientists who don't think like you, are they dumb? No, they're not dumb. They're probably smarter than me. They've got a lot more resources for whatever they do. But they, they've got a handicap, an, a, a false um, foundation, a false worldview. Science founded on Genesis has an advantage. We start with a true foundation. The worldview is based on creation plus the, the flood and all these things that go along with it. Does this mean that we're always going to do things right? No, because we're human. We're all human. We all founder along and, and, and make mistakes. But we have, a, we have a correct starting point, a true foundation. <coughs> so up here is where there's conflict between uh, human wisdom and, and um, divine wisdom. Down here, when we start with this foundation, then we can have mutual support. Genesis and science can be supportive um, to each other. So, um, pursuing this a little further, how, how does this work? How do we make them work together? Well, we, make, we have to think about a, a division here between two different steps in this process. The first one is the questions we ask. A more accurate worldview or foundation can result in better questions and hypotheses. Uh, whereas the next step is the answers. Okay, when we seek answers, this is, this is different now. I don't find anywhere in the Bible where it tells me how to do science, what data to collect, how to analyze my data. Okay, God left that for us to figure out. <clears throat> so to answer, the, the, we ask questions here. The, the, the Bible will influence what questions we ask and what hypotheses we think of. But to answer those questions, now we have to use normal scientific procedures. That's all we've got. God has not given us um, different procedures. <clears throat> we, can, we sometimes come up with actually better procedures. But... Um, but they have to be things that other scientists can use as well, just like, like we do. So the questions we ask, the answers we seek. The questions, that's where the biggest influence is. What questions and what ideas do we think of when we're, when we're starting with the Bible? Okay, so does this actually work? I've got proposing this idea that we can use science and, and the Bible together. Does this work? Well, yes, uh, it does. Um, in, if we're studying biology, how did life begin? Uh, can, can, can macroevolution, the origin of, of reptiles and starfish and uh, birds, can that happen by evolution? The, these ideas here are running into serious problem from the evidence itself. <clears throat> so, but I'm going to talk about geology. And there are many examples I could give. I'm going to start with, a, with an example, study of fossil whales in Peru, which will illustrate uh, the concepts that I'm going to be, that I'm discussing. So there's a research project that we did in, in Peru. Uh, a group of us were down there giving some lectures, and somebody said, do you want to see some fossil whales? Well, yeah, sure, we'd like to. Now, the people who asked the question were not scientists, so we had no idea what we would see. But indeed, we saw some fossil whales, some amazing fossil whales. And so we began a research project. This is the, the Pisco Formation, it's called, in, in Peru, <coughs> coastal Peru. This is along the, on the coastal plain, the west side of Peru. Uh, the Andes Mountains are right over here. Here you can see them. It's a little more clear that day, at least the foothills of the Andes. Um, this, this formation... Uh, 
at one time filled this space all the way between here and the, and the Andes. A lot of it has eroded away, but it's left these, these hills um, with uh, sediment that is, has a lot of fossils, just full of, of fossils. This is not one of them, but anyway, we see. <laughs> um, okay, for those of you who are familiar with this chart of the geologic column, we have this stack of rocks, one above the other with different fossils. And the, the, Peru, the Peruvian fossils um, in the Pisco Formation are right here between the Miocene and Pliocene. And that's probably not during the main part of the flood, we think, but it kind of at the, at the end or, or right after the flood. That's our opinion. <clears throat> it's an amazing place. It's the driest place in the world. Um, I've seen an official figure of one, an, a, an average of one millimeter of rain per year. Well, you can, you can see, um, you know, that's the way it looks, right? Um, I, I experienced what probably one of the big rainstorms there. We were out there camping and there was uh, clouds and uh, a rainbow and, and everything like you'd expect. And I, I think I felt a, a few dozen, dozen drops of rain. Okay, that was a, a Atacama Desert rainstorm. <clears throat> Beautiful sand dunes. And, uh, you know, there, there are, uh, most of the United States, for instance, and many other places, there, there are a lot of beautiful rocks, but they're covered with a lot of green stuff, you know, trees and plants and things. Well, bio geologists like places they don't have all this green stuff. You can see the rocks and the fossils. Well, you can certainly see them down here. There is one plant you find, basically, just about one, only one plant, where you don't have rivers or other things that would provide water. And this is an interesting plant. You find it on the tops of the hills. When you're hiking out in the woods, if you find a turtle, it's kind of fun to pick it up and look at it and put it down. But we don't normally do that with plants. Uh, but this plant, you can do exactly that. Uh, there are no roots. There's no use to have roots. There's no water in the ground. And so you can pick it up, examine it, and put it back down. The moisture comes from a mist that comes into these high hills from the, from the ocean in the morning. It's like the Garden of Eden, you know, watered by a mist. Well, sort of like that. Anyway, otherwise no plants, which it makes it real easy to study. Um, when we camped, we don't find a, a, a little patch of woods to camp in. You camp out here. This is our fanciest campground, so we call it the Brujita Hilton. <clears throat> this is a Peruvian paleontologist who became a dear friend we were, always worked with down there, Mario. If I have time, I'll tell you some stories about Mario. <clears throat> the, there are abundant fossils and they're all beautifully preserved. Uh, there are dolphins. Um, this one would bring $10,000 on the black market. That's one of the problems uh, about fossils, studying fossils down there. There are uh, beautiful penguins, well preserved, uh, many other things. We were interested in the whales and there are innumerable fossil whales. A whale is a, is a unique creature. It has a huge skull, and then the, the uh, vertebral column, and rib cage, and front limbs, and, and no back limbs. And so we find a, a, a fossil, you've got this huge skull, and the rest of the body goes back here. Uh, the, the whales we studied are mostly related to blue whales, and fin whales, and psi whales. So they're, they would look similar to this when they're alive. They were different species. They're an extinct species. But um, we're getting more saguaros back. <laughs> so anyway, there, there are um, innumerable thousands of, of these whales. OK. I don't know if there's something I'm touching here or what it is. But <clears throat> so here's what they will often look like out in the desert. They've been damaged by erosion in, in modern times. Uh, but you can still find the skull and uh, the vertebral column and flippers, and like this, the whole thing is here, even though he's been damaged. The skull and the rest of the body there, and the flippers are falling apart, but they're still there. We, uh, Dr. Chadwick, who was my um, collaborator in starting this research, uh, used his um, very sophisticated GPS system for determining where the whales are. So we could uh, pinpoint the location of every whale. Um, this, this equipment 
gives an accuracy of less than a centimeter, which is more than we needed, I mean, for a whale 40 feet long. But anyway, that's the equipment we had, and it worked very well for determining um, the location of these whales so we could map them um, in our computer. And <coughs> I, I mentioned there were a lot of whales. Here's one of our primary study areas, uh, roughly a square mile. And there are about 360 whales in, in this square mile. Okay, where can you find 360 whales in, in a square mile? Uh, and the dots, you notice there are two different kinds, black and, and red, and they're labeled partial whales and complete whales. This is a little bit misleading, because, but the, some of them are partial whales because they've been damaged by erosion uh, in, in modern times. Uh, but the evidence is pretty clear that these were all basically complete whales. And this, this is a hill. We took this uh, aerial photograph of this hill, plotted the whales on it, and the lines are, are different layers in the hill. Uh, they are layers of, of hard sediment that go through the hill. And so these, these whales are, are in this hill. And <clears throat> this is a, a picture of the side of that same hill. And notice here we, we counted the, 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 we figured out the area and counted the whales. And in the upper parts, you get up to 350 whales per square kilometer. Again, that's just absolutely amazing. And they're in uh, sediment. Part of it is, is sandstone, and part of it is uh, uh, diatom, diatomite, or diatomaceous uh, sediment. It uh, has a lot of diatoms in it. Diatoms are, little, are microscopic organisms that live in water just about everywhere. And they, they, the little beautiful skeletons uh, die and settle down on the bottom and make a deposit. If you have a swimming pool, you probably use filter material called diatomaceous earth. Well, that's, that's based on, on these diatoms. That's what it is. These, these very fine, delicate diatoms of the little holes make a good filtering material because they're so small. And this is uh, what many of the whales are, are buried in. Okay, the, we learned pretty quickly there that the accepted scenario here is that this sediment accumulated a few centimeters thick per thousand years. Okay, and the, 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 what's behind this is today, sediments, diatoms living in the ocean will die. The little skeletons settle down through the water and they accumulate on the bottom a few centimeters per thousand years. So it was thought this is the way this happened. The sediment formed um, that slowly. So it took uh, millions of years to, to produce all of this. That's the accepted explanation. But we noticed right away there's a problem. There's, there's a conflict here in the data and the, and the theory. You have these beautiful, well-preserved whales. Okay, if you've got a whale that big, his body's gonna be maybe this thick, and it's gonna take a number of tens of thousands of years to bury him. Is that realistic? They're beautifully preserved whales. Um, How's that going to work? Well, so the questions we asked, most people will look at this and they already know how many millions of years it took. They know that. That's a, to them, that's a fact. Uh, but we, the questions we asked were simply, how fast were the sediment and the whales deposited? We didn't constrict ourselves to any particular, we, had, we didn't believe in those millions of years anyway. Uh, can slow burial preserve complete whales? That's our other question. <coughs> What, the, what are the possibilities here? Our hypothesis, the whales were buried much faster. And you can guess where we got that idea. Well, one place. Uh, I mean, our, our worldview tells us it's gotta be faster, but just looking at the evidence tells us something is wrong with that uh, um, accepted scenario, with that ex explanation. So, what happens now when whales die? And there are people who study this. This, is, this field is called taphonomy, and that means study of how fossilization occurs. It's a study of all the processes from the death of an, of an organism to it's buried and becomes fossils. And you can do taphonomy research yourself. Um, I sometimes call, say taphonomy is a study of dead and rotting things, because that's what it is. Let's 
this process from death to fossilization. So you can, you find a cat that got killed on the road, just kick it off in the ditch and go every day and take notes on what's happening. That's taphonomy. Um, it's not a lot of fun, but <clears throat> it gives us important information. Well, when a whale dies, think how much food that is. They're lying on the bottom of the ocean. And thousands of organisms, I mean, literally, they've counted. And there are many thousands of, of organisms on a whale and beginning to eat the flesh uh, and take advantage of that food supply. Okay, so how fast does that happen? Well, in a few months, maybe up to six months, this is what it looks like. The flesh is gone. The scavengers, the, the, the sharks and all the rest eat the flesh and the invertebrates, and then the next, the next crew comes in, the ones who start chewing on the bones, breaking down the bones to get uh, uh, nutrition that is there in the bones. And all, see these white things? Little worms that are, that are burrowing into the sediment to get the oil that is leached out of, out of the whale. And uh, this goes on. Pretty soon the whale looks like this. You can get clear evidence that there's time has passed because the, the organisms are chewing the bones apart. And in a few years, the bones are gone. And the baleen, the, the filtering material in the mouth, it's not bone, it falls out in a few days or maybe a few weeks at most. So that's what happens when whales die. So how do you get this? What we have in the ancient world, in the Pisco Formation. Um, the whale is complete. The bones show no evidence of creatures burrowing or chewing on them. Do you even have baleen right here in the mouth like this? The baleen is preserved. Um, <clears throat> the uh, a student that we worked with and, and myself and a couple others published a paper on baleen in fossil whales, fossil baleen. And in all the museums of the United States, a half, about a half a dozen specimens of fossil baleen were, were found. Okay, in this paper, we described 31 whales with baleen. And since that time, many more have been found. And so there's something interesting going on here. All these things preserve so well. The diatoms are well preserved. I mentioned how diatoms in the ocean, they die and they settle to the bottom. As they're sinking, <coughs> sinking through the water, <clears throat> to that seawater, they're dissolving. And by the time they get deposited on the bottom, only one or two percent are actually preserved. But look at our diatoms. They're beautiful, uh, completely preserved. Something is interesting is going on here. The, the past, the ancient past, is different from the modern world. Sediment, a few thousand years preserved. Well-preserved whales and diatoms. <clears throat> This is our, our, one of our favorite whales. It, we could each take a picture by it and then show people the whale that we discovered, that we found. Okay, how can this be? How can, the, how can you have this preservation with rapidly, with slowly deposited sediment? Uh, <clears throat> that's our question and that's what we're pursuing. Some examples of the whales. This is one we called Carmen. Um, beautifully preserved, the bones are all there. They're not being chewed apart. They're, they're excellent. They are, it's articulated. There's one difference. Notice this flipper is complete with all the finger bones and everything. Look at this one here. There's no flipper. Okay, how'd that happen? Well, we find shark teeth associated with these whales. Some of them as big as your hand. In a couple of places we found shark teeth embedded in the bone. Okay, so the sharks are, are devouring the flesh. And now this, probably the sharks made off with this flipper. <clears throat> There's another one. You can see the enormous whale just excellently preserved out on the barren desert. This one is, is small, about two meters, two yards long. But it's ex exceptionally well preserved. All, every bone is in place. You have the baleen right here in the mouth. And something else you see, you see all this orange colored sediment? Okay, the Pisco sediment is not orange. You never find it orange except in one situation, and that is with a fossil. And the reason for that is this tells us that there was still flesh on these bones, at least some flesh, when the bale, whale was buried. Because it's the, it's the decay of the flesh that sets up a chemical environment that uh, accumulates heavy minerals and other things and makes this color. Um, 
And so it's, it's an, another, another um, evidence that they were rapidly buried and preserved. And we, we discussed quite a bit what is, what is causing this shape. Is this actually the skin that's preserved? Or is it just that the, the chemical change only went out this far? Well, we don't know for sure. But it certainly tells us this was buried very rapidly um, and preserved that way. Here's another evidence. Here's a big whale. I'll say more about this one. Uh, but we took one of the vertebrae from right in here and cut it in half. And notice this space right here. That's where the spinal cord was. And um, if you ever study human anatomy or, or any, you realize that the brain and the spinal cord are just very soft, mushy tissue. You wonder, how does that thing work? Well, very soft tissue. That would not last very long. Oops. Um, I know that's a, an amazing thing, but I didn't think it would shut off the computer. But anyway, um, what is all this? This is a heavy mineral which accumulates there because of the decay of the tissue. So this, this spinal cord was still there uh, when the thing was buried. And that whale is one we named Fernanda. And Fernanda has something else interesting. Uh, every, every bone is in place, that's interesting. But right here, you have a, a slab of this baleen that when the whale died and landed there, that baleen came out of the mouth and it drifted back and landed right here. The evidence in the sediment tells us the current was moving under this whale and it carried this baleen over and landed it right there. And here it is, uh, this baleen. It's, it's lying there on the flipper. And you know, baleen, it's, um, it's not bone. It's like keratin, like your fingernails. But still, these proteins don't last long. When a, when a creature dies now, the, the protein begins to break down. And it may la it last, uh, it, it can last quite a while. It can last a few thousand years. But millions of years? No, that that's really doesn't, can't happen. Uh, and this would be made out of protein. And here we look closely at it. This is a picture of the surface of that baleen. Here's a cross section. These dark lines, that's, that's a cross section through the baleen plates. And the white material is the, the diatomaceous sediment between the plates. And right here, you see the surface of one of these plates. And this is what it looks like under the microscope. And this is soft. This is not fossil. This is protein. This is still tissue that's there. And I, I know that because I sent a sample of this to a, a scientist in North Carolina, Mary Schweitzer, who, who studies um, fossilized uh, biominerals, uh, I mean uh, biomolecules. And she determined that this, in fact, is protein. And here's a, a picture uh, under, taken under an um, electron microscope of the same baleen. And it's multiple layers of kind of fibrous material with the fibers going in different directions. This was buried very, very fast to be preserved this way. Amazing thing. Okay, so <clears throat> the evidence indicate very rapid burial for these whales. Um, and this is an interesting whale. This is, uh, the, the whales, they were not beached. They're not, they're not lying on a beach. They died in the water and sank down in these shallow bays to the bottom. Uh, and they, they sometimes broke apart on the way down, like the Titanic. As it's sinking, it breaks apart and you ended it uh, the way it is. Well, this whale, everything is there. It's well preserved. But, but the skull, which is a massive, heavy skull, is sitting on top of the rib cage. So how do you do that? Can water, even with strong water current, can move this heavy thing and drop it on top of the rib cage? I think probably not. But as it sank, apparently they, they, it broke apart right there, and the, the skull moved over and s settled down on top of the rib cage. This is another one. Uh, it's complete, but it broke apart on the way down as it was sinking. And so like right here are the neck vertebrae, but they're turned around. And so that part, it broke apart in a couple of places, and those turned as it was settling down and landed there together. 
And here's the same whale, and anyway, graduate student Raul Esperanti um, for scale. Um, and here's the skull of this whale. We had moved over there and settled down. So um, there's some things happening as, it's, as it comes down to the bottom, but yet the bones are beautifully preserved. Um, this did not take a long time to happen. So these diatoms, let's talk a little bit more about diatoms. <clears throat> Diet, diatoms and other organisms that live in, in the, what we call plankton, these floating creatures at the top of the water, um, they can, they can uh, multiply under the right conditions. We call these red tides, these blooms, where they just, they have a lot of uh, nutrients in the water and they, they multiply tremendously and make these uh, blooms, the red tides. And this shows you how much they can multiply. This is something that's called marine snow. These are diatoms. Um, they've died and they're settling down, but there are massive amounts. Okay, so why does this matter? Well, we ask ourselves, why did these, all these whales die? And probably two factors are involved. <clears throat> we can't really demonstrate exactly, but, but there's good evidence that you have at least two things. Um, there's a lot of volcanic ash in the sediment, along with the diatoms. Okay, the, at the time this, these were dying and settling down was when the Andes Mountains were forming. They were forming, they're, they're volcanic. The Andes are volcanic. There's a tremendous amount of volcanic ash involved. They're pushing up um, and finally push these whales up out of the water. But breathing volcanic ash with its sharp glass shards is not good for your health. And so uh, certainly this could, could kill whales. <clears throat> but also um, you have at the same time all these diatoms. Uh, toxic diatom blooms or red tides. And there's evidence today that uh, the toxins from diatom blooms can kill big mammals. Here's an episode in California in 2000. Uh, many sea lions were killed and they were able to study these freshly killed sea lions and determine that the death was from uh, toxins from the diatoms. Okay, so our whales were probably done in by a combination of these things. Toxins from the red tides and from uh, volcanic ash. And, <clears throat> and there's evidence that they, so why, but still you ask, why were there so many whales? Well, the, to, the, the diatoms tell us these were not diatoms living in the shallow water. These are deep water diatoms. So the picture is probably happening, the, the, you got these, you have a lot of nutrients like the volcanic ash it has a lot of iron and other things that, are, that make the diatoms bloom rapidly, well, multiply rapidly. So offshore here, you've got all these, these plankton blooms, tremendous food. And so the whales congregate for this food source and uh, <clears throat> they die. And then in the sediment, there's evidence that says that there was a lot of storms um, and, and currents that would bring these whales and the diatoms into shore and concentrate them in the shore, in, in the shallow water. That's why we would have so many whales um, and all this, this diatom material concentrated there in the shallow water. So summarize the evidence. <clears throat> we have complete whales, many of them complete. Not every place, there are some layers right at the very bottom where they're broken apart, but most of them are very complete the bones are in pristine condition, even the baleen preserved. The diatoms are in pristine condition. This was all happening very rapidly. So uh, slow sediment deposition, that was the theory that was accepted. And, and there were other geologists and paleontologists who'd been studying this for 20 years before we got there. And they published a lot of papers and they still thought it was slow depos uh, deposition. So you got a conflict between evidence and theory. The evidence, this theory, slow deposition, the evidence in the whales and the diatoms requires a rapid burial. <clears throat> so we can ask the question, why did no one else notice this? Others have been studying this for, for you know, decades. Why did they not publish anything on this? Well, it comes down, I believe, to your worldview. 
their worldview told them they knew that this was millions of years. They knew it had to be slow. We came in and we looked at it, it immediately hit us in the face. There's something wrong here. The evidence does not fit together. And our biblical world caused us to think new thoughts and to ask new questions, which they were not asking because they were stuck in, in a false worldview. So I believe that's the main reason why nobody else noticed this. And we find this common. We, we come to a, a place and study a place and we ask questions that others are not asking. In fact, I give you a specific example. My, my graduate student, Raul Esperante, is from Spain. And <clears throat> he's now a member of the Geoscience Research Institute. And when he was, before he came to Loma Linda to get his doctorate, he was studying in Spain, and they actually, he had trouble in the graduate program there because he's a creationist, and so he had to leave. And one of his professors, though, <clears throat> after he graduated and went back, <clears throat> this professor wanted to study with with him. He wanted to work with Raul to study fossil whales in, in Spain. And Raul finally asked him, and this guy was an atheist, as far as I know. Raul asked him, why do you want to work with me? Because I'm a creationist. And he said, well, you, you ask different questions. He, he realized something was, was different here. He, asked, he looked at things in new ways and asked different questions. And this is what we find repeatedly. So a false worldview can lead to false conclusions. It can blind us to conflicts between the evidence and interpretations. Because the false worldview tells you it has to be a certain way, when maybe it wasn't that way. <clears throat> um, comparing different hypotheses or different worldviews gives us a broader base, and I think this is important. It's just that we, we kind of know they're wrong. But it gives us a broader base of thinking for asking questions and interpreting evidence. We have an advantage that these people don't understand, and that is, I, I read a lot of the anti-creationist literature. I want to know what they're saying and if I can answer it. But, but reading that material, it's obvious that they really know almost nothing about how an educated creationist thinks. They know their worldview. They know their approach to science. They don't know anything about another one. Whereas those of us who, who believe the Bible, if we also want to do science, we have to know not only our way of thinking, we have to know everything they know and everything they think. We have to know both worldviews. And my friends and I are all the time thinking about this and thinking about these two points of view and trying to see where we can find things to test. Where this comparison of worldviews gives us an advantage, gives us a broader base for thinking and for asking questions and interpreting evidence. It opens our mind to, to new ideas. So <clears throat> and a true worldview gives an advantage. It opens our minds to notice conflicts between data and interpretations. It suggests new questions. So we ask new questions. It suggests new hypotheses, new ways of thinking. The, the Bible, however, does not give us new scientific procedures. It, it to tell, you, tell us that if, if Jesus is there, you can catch fish where you wouldn't otherwise. But, other, but it doesn't give us um, scientific procedures. It does, doesn't tell us how to do this research. God left that for us to figure out. Uh, we must address our new questions and hypotheses with standard scientific procedures that others can use. And like I say, sometimes we actually come up with better procedures than they're using. But they have to be procedures that other scientists can use, just like we do. Um, and it works. <clears throat> There's no question it works. If you, in science, if you can publish your material in peer-reviewed literature, then, then that gives you a, a, a certain um, confidence that you've got something worthwhile. And the peer review process, what that means is you send in a, a paper in to be published. They'll send it to several experts who will read it and look for errors in it, look for problems in, in your evidence. And if it passes that review, then it gets published. And there's some scientists who, who know, know us, that know that we're creationists, and they're skeptical of what we do. And that is very obvious sometimes. However, we do get our things published. If, we do, if you're doing good work, you can sooner or later get it published. This article was 
was addressing the, the, the key question there with the whales. Can they be buried slowly or did it have to be rapid? And we pointed out that the evidence says these had to have been buried very rapidly. And so, you know, I wondered, am I ever going to get this published? <clears throat> and I spent a summer with the literature, studying diatoms, trying to figure out how this could happen. Because I had to suggest in this paper that the sediment was accumulating several orders of magnitude. That's, that means millions of times faster than others thought. I wondered, will that ever get published? Well, I studied the literature and came up with some ideas. We were able to, come to get these papers uh, read to get an informal review by some experts. And they said, well, yeah, your evidence supports your theory. <clears throat> um, and for instance, this article, Raul and I presented this at a conference in Spain. Um, it was a small taphonomy conference. There might be 150 people. And, um, we, uh, Raul knew some of those people, so he emailed them and asked them, how big can our posters be? They, they invited world experts to come and give talks. The rest of us gave posters. And he never got an answer. So we prepared po two posters like we do for, for Geological Society of America meetings. Um, about a meter high and uh, seven feet long. So we had two of those. Well, Raul went over there and he went to see the guy who was in charge of the posters and asked him, how big the posters can be. And he said, one meter square, one yard square. Well, Raul said, okay, well, we're in trouble. And the guy said, well, show me your posters. So he rolled them both out on the floor, and the guy said, we'll definitely put those up. And <clears throat> so he gave us a space down the, down a little ways from the others. It was big, big enough. And uh, he said, you put them up there, and that when, when we view the posters, there were two hour and a half sessions, one after the other. And he said, you leave your posters up the whole time. <laughs> so, so we did, and we had a chance to actually visit with the, the two, two of the top taphonomists in the world for an hour and a half with, about our poster. And they said, you got, your data supports what you're saying, your data supports your conclusion. And in fact, one of those was, a, was an official reviewer when the paper was submitted. And <clears throat> The evidence to me said these had, each whale had been buried within uh, days or weeks at most. But I thought that'll never get published because scientists don't, just don't think that way. And so I softened it a little bit. I said, well, um, weeks or, or months to, to, year, to a few years. Well, in this review of the paper, this lady, well, the, the top expert, she said, now your data says it has to be faster than that, uh, days or weeks. So I put it back in and I got it published. And this, this, is, this is probably the, the most prestigious journal in the field of geology. And the, um, I've met the, the, the one who was the editor of the journal, Dr. Fastovsky. And one of my friends, a creationist, was a student, a graduate student of his at that time. And this guy told me that the editor knew that I was, he knew about Loma Linda, he knew I was probably a creationist. But he didn't care. He felt we did good work, and so he published it. <clears throat> and so, if we're going to do sloppy work, God doesn't need our help. But if, we, if we're careful, we may indeed get things published, and we, we do generally. <clears throat> One other article on, on the whales, a, a big paper, we submitted it to a journal. One of the reviews came back, about four pages of nitpicking criticisms. And the last page, he says, now, this is interesting research, but you guys are well-known conservative creationists, and we can't trust you. And he, he, the paper didn't get published. But we submitted it to a different journal, just as good a journal. And it got published, and the editor said, we think this will be a very important paper. So you be persistent, you have courage, and you keep doing good work, and you'll get your stuff uh, published. So conclusions. The numerous fossil whales are well preserved. They were not beached. They sank in shallow water. There's no indication of any special conditions that would inhibit decay. The preservation requires rapid burial. And these, all this material uh, accumulated several orders of magnitude faster than usually believed. So one order of magnitude would be 10 times faster. Two orders of magnitude means 100 times faster. So we're talking about millions of times faster than most people believe. Okay, abundant nutrients from upwelling of nutrient-rich cold water and from volcanic ash that made all these, these plankton blooms. 
Um, the toxic blooms and volcanic ash is probably what killed the animals. Currents and storms brought the diatoms and the vertebrates into or toward shore, concentrating them in shallow bays, and that buried the whales quickly. And this is not a, a, a unique situation. At that same time in the geologic record, many places around the world there was diatomite accumulating very rapidly, and it all has beautifully preserved fossils, everything from little insects to whales, although usually they don't have a lot of whales like they do in Peru. This was unique. So there was something happening at this stage right after the flood that was depositing all this stuff so quickly that with well-preserved fossils. <clears throat> okay, further concluding. Believing the Bible opened our eyes to see new things and ask new questions. And we then use accepted scientific procedures to answer the questions. So this foundation, this biblical foundation and process gave better answers. Better questions and better answers. And Believing the Bible um, does this, and every time some of us have used this process, it has brought scientific success. So I'm giving you one example, but there are, I have a list of other situations that have led to uh, published scientific papers which are challenging the accepted dogmas, and they've gotten uh, published. Well, this one is a new project, but the others <clears throat> have been published in good scientific journals. And so I won't, don't have time to go through all these, but there are, there are a number of these cases, and there's more of these in process right now uh, that are yielding very fascinating results. So it's something that indeed works. Now, <clears throat> do we build our faith on science? I know friends who, who do this, and uh, you know they're good, good people, but our faith is built on the Bible, not on science. That we, it, the science often will bring us new evidence that supports our faith. But our faith has to be built on science, on Bible, the Bible, or we will go in our own direction ultimately. <clears throat> but when we build on the foundation of faith, our science gives us better answers to scientific questions. So we don't do science to prove the Bible. But if we believe the Bible, it will help us to do better science and we'll find helpful evidence. And this happens over and over again, so it's not a unique thing. <clears throat> so we got out this God who wants to communicate with us, and we got somebody else involved who'd like to lead us a different direction. So this is an important principle all through life, including in science. Choose for yourselves who you will serve. And <clears throat> I'll finish with a couple of stories. They're interesting. When we do this kind of work, we, it brings us in contact with people who think differently than we do. And it leads to some very interesting interactions with these people. There are some, there are a lot of scientists who would just say we're a bunch of nit, bunch of nitwits, a bunch of you know, ignorant creationists. But not everybody's like that. Um, I, I mentioned Mario that we studied with down there, we worked with. He's a Peruvian paleontologist, probably the most productive paleontologist that, that we know of and, and, and that in that area. Um, and we met Mario and we, we, on each trip we would hire him as, as a consultant to work with us. And he was extremely helpful. Uh, not only does he know the paleontology, but he knows the culture. He helped us to get through you know, a lot of issues there like when we were robbed and uh, other things and he, he was very helpful. Um, and he had no religious background as far as I could tell. <clears throat> uh, but he would listen politely to our, our devotional times in the morning, he'd help us, help us cook vegetarian food, and et cetera, and just became a dear friend. And there were a lot of interesting experiences we had with Mario. He, he, he noticed uh, you know, our faith in the Bible, and he noticed something else, and he commented a couple times, every time you people come, I find fossils I've been looking for for 20 years. <laughs> and, and he began to attribute this to our faith. And he began to think about these things. And I, I remember one time I, after we left, I emailed him and, I, um, he was, and uh, he emailed me and he was telling about troubles he was having down there um, with some of the, the people who don't like his work his paleontology work, because they have crazy ideas and he doesn't go along with their crazy ideas. 
Uh, one guy has determined these are, these are our dinosaurs, which they obviously are not, they're whales. But anyway, he's telling about his troubles and he said, pray for me. Well, I'm uh, certainly happy to do that. Um, <clears throat> and the way Mario lives his life, I found very interesting. Um, he has a burden to help these people in some of these very poor uh, villages around where the whales are. He wants to help them uh, economically and just whatever way he can. He has a burden for this. And I, he began to, he asked a couple of questions once about, you know, well, how do you go to heaven? Well, one time I tried to explain to him and he says, no, he says, no, God can't take me now. I've got too many things to do for these poor people in Okokahi. Um, there are more experiences I, I could tell you, but he kind of at, after, at the time when I was finishing up my work there, um, uh, we've, we left, we were leaving one time and I was paying him the money that, that we owed him and, and I said, I hope this will keep you supplied in tamales and donkey meat. We used to tease him about the donkey meat he likes to eat. And he says, oh no, and, and, and Mario has nothing. He, he, he works for the, the Natural History Museum in Lima, but they don't have money to pay people like him. It's volunteer work. I mean, he's a full-time volunteer paleontologist. And he, make, he survives by people like us hiring him to help them, help him, to help us. And he lives in a little shack that belongs to somebody else. They let him live there. He has nothing. But he said, in response to my, to my question, he says, oh no, he says, I use this money to hire local people to help me find fossils and haul them home. So that way the money gets recycled to people poorer than I am. <clears throat> and and I, I thought of what Jesus said. If you've done it to one of the least of my children. And, <clears throat> and that's the way Mario lives his life. And um, one time uh, he was communicating with a couple of paleontologists in Europe. He wanted you to get them to come and study his seals, his fossil seals. And they looked on the internet and they found out that we're creationists. And they emailed Mario and they said, don't work with these guys. They're creationists, they'll destroy your reputation, get rid of them, don't work with them. And Mario emailed back and says, they have their beliefs and I don't care what they believe. In the field they work like other paleontologists and better. And he threw them off of his list of collaborators and kept us. And, 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 after I had quit working there, I, I had some email communications with him. In one of his emails, he said, it's, been an, it's an honor to have known you in this life. What's that tell you? He's thinking about another life. <laughs> and, and there's good evidence that that's true. And so we, we have a chance to be helpful to other people. And this, this is a, maybe as valuable as what we, the stuff we find and publish. And, uh, so if we love people, love the Bible, uh, it, it changes life and it, it, uh, it makes things much better all the way around. Thank you.